What happens when a Mark 18 is too big for the job? Up next on my channel. Yep. What's up everyone and I've recorded this video at least three times. I've been working on this since January and every single time that I try to record this I just get another part of this video and another part of this firearm that I need to test. I want to test because I'm very excited because for the first time in a decade I've actually wanted a Sig Sauer product. I bought a, uh, a Mark 25 about a decade ago and I really love it, but it's old technology. It's 1980s, well actually a 1970s design. And Sig really hasn't impressed me with a lot of designs that have been coming out. I got the unfortunate uh, pleasure to shoot the Sig 556 series of rifle, which is not a 550. And it was a major letdown. Um, we tried our best to get good groups on those rifles and if I was lucky it was a five inch gun at 100 yards. Tried multiple different bullet weights. Um, it just was kind of a shit show and honestly it didn't even look like a 550 and the fit and finish wasn't there but it was also you know a, what a fifteen sixteen hundred dollar semi-auto rifle so uh, versus the the real deal save 550s which go for you know four grand so this has been the very first product in a long time that i really wanted i like the mcx initially but there are some design issues like uh, for one key mod I, i'm just i'm not a big fan of key mod that was on the gen one the barrel was a pretty light contour and also the commercial version didn't pan out like the military one did so when I saw the, what's it, the low visibility assault weapon, LVAW, that is what I wanted. I wanted a short barrel, 300 blackout, as quiet as possible. Because when I saw the, the uh, SIG reps on range days, they would tell us about this six and a half inch or so barrel 300 blackout that mic'd better than an MP5 SD. And that's incredible. If you can keep an MP5 SD noise level with a 300 blackout, that was just tits. Well, the initial ones were all 16 inch barrels. And then of course, you know, SIG doesn't really do very well at telling us generations. They just make a new model and then magically that becomes the new generation. Uh, so the Virtus came out and that was a gen two and really the Rattler I consider almost a gen three. Uh, because that was truly what was originally designed for this spec. So, without further ado, let me show you the Rattler. Now, this is in the smallest configuration, and this is in an Everly stock uh, dagger, hydration pack. And this is the MCX Rattler. Now, this is in a 
five and a half inch 5.56. Five, in this configuration, it is just as tiny of a package as you can get. I do want to get a hand stop for it, but it is just as compact as possible. Uh, why would you need this? Um, typically, the, the whole spec for the Rattler was a, a vehicle gun. Uh, I do believe the spec was for it, uh, for British soldiers, they want to be able to have something like this in the regiment in a glove box. And this supposedly will fit in a European style glove box. Now my Toyota Tacoma, it's literally the flash hider length too long to, to get in there. So that's, that's a little bit of a bummer. However, I can pack this up no problem anywhere else. Uh, going from, I guess his grand thumb would say tip to butt, we have a not so permanent flash hider. They wanted uh, to pin this so that no dummy would put a can on this and try to shoot suppressed. Uh, unfortunately, there's already people that have found how, how to make an adapter for this. So they are shooting suppressed with a five and a half inch 556. Five, I think dead air is the only one that actually will you know warranty such a short barrel. We have a two position gas system, which is still pretty freaking tight. I have to get a piece of brass right now to cycle it. The handguard is a low profile M lock style handguard. Uh, people say that this thing's chonky, but not compared to the SD grip that came with the cane brake for other people. They say that this grip is really ch chonky. But I mean, I've got medium man hands and I don't seem to have any issue gripping around the, uh, the hand guard there. This is a, a truly modular rifle. Unlike an AR where you have to basically change uppers, you can just change your, uh, your grips, uh, your hand guards, everything with just a, a basically a push pin and a Torx wrench. Uh, Torx bit T27 is required for this. So first thing you want to do, pop your front pivot pin out. As the bolt is locked back and you checked for an empty chamber, you're going to pull the handguard off. We have two screws, Torx bit screws, T27s, numbered one and two. This handguard cannot get installed unless that screw is tightened down. So, I like to put the pivot pin back in. We're going to loosen the first screw. We're loosen the second screw. And you're gonna loosen it till it's all the way free. Because your bolt is pulled all the way back, you can now pull the barrel out, which can be kind of tight. Especially on a new barrel. There, barrel is pulled out. That is your 556 five, barrel. Now, you can see this clamping mechanism here. This is what causes, let's see if I can see this really good for you. This clamp wraps around this ledge here. When I install the next barrel, which is our 300 blackout. If you see here, how the ledge gets pulled in by this clamp. Tighten this guy down, and again, you can do this hand tight if you need to in an emergency. It's not going to be as accurate. You're not going to have as repeatable of a group. But when it comes to torquing, make sure that you torque the first bolt for the second. Now, since that's tight, we're going to get our torque wrench out. Set to 65 inch pounds. 
and we're just going to torque each one of these. And we're going to go back and forth to make sure that it's torqued. See how that moved a little bit? That's good. All right, so that's torqued down. Now, because we have our suppressed barrel on, it's time to install the SD handguard. And you'll notice that the handguard itself is retained by this lug here and the front pivot pin. And just like that, you converted from 5.56 to 300 blackout. And then here is the magic. This is their quick change barrel system. This barrel system has two bolts in it and an indexing notch here and on this side. That indexing notch is the maximum point that you can push down with this barrel and so the safety Nazis don't see or freak out, I'm clear. The Torx heads have a one and a two on them numbered. So once you fully loosen these, the barrel pops off, you know, no big deal. Uh, you have to, I found out you have to fully, fully loosen these and these are captured so they just don't fall out. And once you loosen it, you pop this out and then you can pop in your 300 blackout five and a half inch barrel. These are both five and a half inch barrels, but one's longer than the other. That's because the five and a half inch 556 doesn't have a gas piston with a hole drilled in the barrel. This barrel is so short they had to jerry rig it. So they have a gas manifold here. And after the bullet has started to leave the uh, bore, there's an expansion chamber right here. And that expansion chamber is where the gas expands and then it goes up into the gas piston area. It's very similar to an M1 carbine type system. And I thought it was really cool. It was really, uh, it, it was thinking outside the box. So we got a relatively blank canvas here. We're gonna see how accurate this uh, 556 barrel is on the Rattler. I've got some Mark 262 clone ammo that I'm gonna be using for this just to see what uh, what kind of accuracy I'm expecting. Now the 300 blackout is an absolute hammer. So I'm looking forward to this. Here we are, one, two, three, four, five, six rounds, and you know, hand size group. It's not horrendous. I mean, it is a PDW. That being said, that's shockingly not that far off zero wise compared to my 300 blackout. However, the 300 blackout is printing, oh, shoot, I believe it's a sub one inch group at. 50 yards so not shocking because not a lot of velocity on uh on that guy this uh this bullet might barely be able to stabilize so you'll have that now these barrels are both cold hammer forged and i do believe they are nitride finished there is no chrome lining on it i know that from looking at it but it's a really really cool design uh, with the 556 five, because the problem is once you get down to that below 10 and a half inch barrel a direct impingement system does not want to cycle properly um, if it does it's super over gas it's super violent uh, this <laughs> rifle funny enough I had to set the setting on high on uh, adverse setting because 
the piston was so tight it didn't want to cycle well. So once I put it in the adverse, shot a few mags through it, I could go back to the standard setting and it just ran like a kitten. So that was really cool. But to go back to the barrel, once you pull the barrel out and install the new one, that first Torx head, number one, as you're tightening it down, it has a claw, you can see it here, it pulls down on the top of this shank. That pulls it into the rifle. Then the second screw surrounds that shank and fully supports it. This barrel came off of Optics Planet and it was $600. It also came with a spare bolt. So that's $130 right there. For you know $470 for a cold hammer forged barrel and a gas piston, I think it's actually a really good value. Uh, I initially thought $600 was a little steep considering you can buy a whole Palmetto State Armory rifle that will not work. The gas system on the 556, as you could see, was fully exposed on the front of the handguard with the shorter 300 blackout. You can use a different handguard of the same length, but it will have a little notch in here so that you can properly adjust your, uh, your gas system. The gas system on the 300 Blackout, this was a cane break initially, that gas system uh, would not cycle on subsonics on low power for about 500 rounds. Once I got a few hundred rounds through it, I went back and it just purrs like a kitten. A warning here, this rifle, particularly a the subsonic 300 Blackout, needs proper back pressure for it to work. So, that being said, the, uh, she's tight. So, you OSS fanboys, the problem is with your flow through design, it is not gonna have enough back pressure to cycle this gun. With the way this cycles with the gas piston, I've only found a few loads with subsonics that really gas you up pretty bad. And quite frankly, with this setup, you're almost exclusively running subsonics. You can run supers, I've ran them, but they're, for me, more of a self-defense capacity. I'm only shooting two to three shots, hopefully. Um, and with this setup, kind of the gold standard is the uh, TAC TXs from Barnes. Luckily, I reload, so, you know, throw those bullets on, you know, a 300 blackout case, 110 grain, good to go. I think it's a little sus that uh, SIG in their manual says that this was not designed to run subsonics, in which case, why would you thread it, bro? And more importantly, why would you make the cane break that has a fake can on it? I kind of question the uh, validity of that statement. Um, I personally think that uh, with a cane break and that uh, nice SD handguard here, you're, you're supposed to run this thing suppressed. So... I don't know where they're getting this from, but it runs like a tank, uh, especially with my AEC Cyclone. Yeah, it's heavy. Yeah, it's big, but it gives just enough gas pressure that this thing is an absolute kitten to shoot um, suppressed with subs. Uh, first few weeks was a little rough, and I wasn't too happy about that. But once everything wore in, just like this gas piston on the 5.56, worked just fine. So back here, we have a flared magwell here for very easy insertion. I really like that the, uh, the trigger on this thing, which will ghost, ghost now, you've got about, I wanna say two and a half, three pounds worth of pressure to get to that first stage. about another pound and a half to pull through. Reset is nice and positive. Okay, so you do go a little bit past that first stage. So you have about a millimeter worth of creep and lets off again, and about two pounds. Again, just a tiny, tiny bit of creep going back to that first stage. It's not like a Glock. And a lot of you guys know how the reset on the Glock is. It's obnoxious, but right then after the reset, you're right there on the wall, at least on the Gen 3s. Trigger's great. Uh, the 
the safeties, uh, I know they wanted to go with the military setup where it's got a 90 degree throw, but in this day and age, it would be really nice to have a 45 degree throw safety. I don't really like the 90s too much, and I've got really weird, creepy alien fingers. They're very long. So I can reach those settings no problem, but you know, for other people, it might be tricky. I do like that the Ambi selector is shorter on uh, a righty's trigger finger to not impede the use of the gun. You see here, that safety is a little bit longer on the dominant right, righty shooters. It does not have a bolt release or a bolt stop on your right side, SIG. Missed. I hate when companies say they're ambidextrous and they're not. A charging handle is. That's slick. But it only has a bolt stop and bolt release on the left side. So keep that in mind. Uh, if that's a deal breaker, I'm sorry. Uh, I guess you could technically put this on like, you know, a... Uh, a night slower, which is technically also not a, a fully ambi setup, but at least has a bolt release. Uh, but it does have a magazine release on both sides. And let me tell you, that mag release is slick. So I don't have issues with it, but some people, they, uh, they go and hit that mag release and it's a bit too short uh, of a button for them. And they have a hard time reaching it. Uh, you have this just this mag release is literally twice as big as a standard ARs mag release, so it's nice to be able to to hit that pretty easily. Now, for me, I got rid of the Rattler handguard or the the pistol grip. Now I have a uh, a standard Magpul grip, and that allows me to reach that magazine release a little easier. Uh, funny enough, again because of my fingers, my finger was out to here when I had the Rattler. Uh, pistol grip on. So again, Magpul to the rescue. The magazine release is really well protected. Um, I guess they could put something back here to protect it, but overall it's very hard to bump. The forward assist or lack thereof. The reason why they wanted to get rid of a forward assist on this gun is because they knew this was going to be a bad gun. This is, was going to be in someone's console or in the side of a vehicle. They want as few snag points as possible. That's why they charging handle is so low profile on this thing too this is all about a concealment gun yeah it, it uh it has the capabilities to doing other things but really this is for putting in a bag going out in the world and people not screaming oh he's got a gun in that bag uh, it's a very very small package compared to other options the mark 18 was one of the smallest rifles out there for conventional forces the problem is trying to pack this, um, you know, cool guys do cool guy stuff, which is not me. They're having issues with, you know, getting this into bags, getting this into vehicles. They came up with the Rattler. If you look, even with the stock collapsed, that Rattler is significantly shorter than a Mark 18. We're talking almost half the, uh, the length. The other thing with an M4 or Mark 18 is for some people, it's a little too heavy. I take some, uh, some friends out to the range and they're smaller stature people. And a lot of times, even a 10 and a half inch gun is just too heavy for them. As opposed to something like this, which you can really feel comfortable tucking that thing in tight and shooting it. Uh, unlike, you know, something like a, a Mark 18. The recoil impulse, is, is different on this thing. Uh, personally, I think you get, I think you get a little bit hair more rise out of it over a, uh, a Mark 18 or other DI guns, but it's smooth. It's not jerky. Half of that is the magic that's inside here, which we'll get to in a minute. Coming back here, this is kind of one of the most revolutionary things, and this is one thing I love. No more castle nuts, no more buffer tubes. This is a Picatinny rail interface, and you simply loosen up this you know, T27 Torx head. This whole stock slides off. 
You can put, I think there's like seven different stocks you can choose from. You can choose from collapsibles. You can choose from the minimalist plus side folding, which this is. You can get the minimalist, which I believe the stock comes down to here. So it's a little bit smaller. Uh, you can get an M4 style collapsing stock, but it is thinner. And next you're probably going to ask, why the hell do I have KC rear sights and nothing up front here? That's because <clears throat> my CAC front sight is on my, my primary hand guard. What SIG did to, to fight the wobble, so to speak, on your upper and lower play, they did something kind of kind of neat. Our upper is apart from our lower. The lower uses a uh, kind of a, essentially the same thing as your M4 buffer uh, detent. And that detent pushes up on the rear lug of your upper to give you a tighter fit. This is kind of a way to get around fitment issues with people that don't like sloppy upper and lowers. I think it's a little bit better of a, a design choice than something like an AccuWedge. AccuWedge is kind of junk. The, the trigger itself is almost a standard AR trigger, except that it's been beefed up a little bit uh, from what the SIG designers have said about the MCX Rattler and Cane Brake. That bolt velocity is a little bit tougher to deal with than with triggers. And apparently the trigger life on a standard AR trigger is just not there. So they had to beef up uh, some of the areas. Like if you look at a Geisley, MCX trigger. They've got a guard around the outside and I believe that is for when the hammer gets cocked back. It's to protect it from overdriving into your uh, your reset. That's that's uh, kind of something to, to keep an eye out on. So apparently these triggers, uh, they were saying that they, these will last tens of thousands of rounds. So I'm kind of excited about that. Now internally here you have your standard MCX buffer to prevent any uh, excessive impact to the end of the receiver and then lots of scalloping internally here. I'm going to assume to cut down on weight because she is a chunky girl. And then of course, because the MCX has a dual recoil spring up top, the top end here is beefed up compared to an AR-15 lower. So the AR-15 lowers can use an MCX upper, but you have to use an adapter in the back here. And that's, you know, that's kind of, Something to keep in mind, you can obviously just buy an upper and put it on your standard SBR lower and call it a day or a pistol brace <clears throat> for now. So, talking about the upper here, this is kind of cool too. So SIG decided that this was gonna be the end all be all rifle setup. So this is a, a very, very well thought out upper. It will not fit a standard charging handle. And that is because of the way that the bolt carrier mates. I think pretty much everyone knows that already. But the bolt carrier on here is a little bit different than your standard AR. It will not take your standard AR bolt if your model is a TAP model. That TAP stands for a tapered lugs on your bolt. The charging handle here is not your standard AR-15 charging handle. It doesn't It's not scalloped enough for that. Uh, so keep that in mind too. So the upper, this is, this is really slick. So this is designed to last, you know, tens of thousands of rounds. And there's some things in here that I really like that I wish M4s had. Uh, for one, if you look at the cam raceway here, that's a steel insert. It is not a, uh, machine piece of aluminum that's one with the upper like an M4. Uh, as you're talking about SBRs, these things tend to be very violent on cams. Uh, I'm not sure about this guy, but when they're talking about, you know, higher velocities on your bolt compared to, uh, say, a standard Virtus action, you know, that kind of has me worried. However, because this is a, a steel removable insert, you just take your Torx bits and pop this thing out, put a new insert in once it's worn out. No big deal. In the back here, you have steel locking pins for your charging handle. I personally, on my old KC style upper, I've actually worn that to the point where the aluminum is gone and that charging handle kind of just 
moves back and forth in there. Not really cool. So now you have roll pins in there that are steel that you can replace. And that's, you know, that's really, really slick. I really love that about the MCX. The final steel insert is your feed lips. Your feed lips are steel. Again, you know, due to wear, they've had, <coughs> they've had issues in the past with the M4 style rifles and they wanted to make sure that this was as durable as possible. The recoil system here, it pains me to say Nut and Fancy had found a really, really bad design with the original Gen 1 MCX, which is why they went with the Gen 2. The number one thing was that these recoil springs, you could remove them for cleaning. Uh, now they are staked. You can't take them off. Uh, you can obviously with taking the pins off, change the uh, the recoil springs, but they, they aren't part of the manual of arms on, on cleaning them. Now, before you could use any standard uh, bolt in there, which was kind of nice. However, <clears throat> just like I'm assuming why Knights has their enhanced bolt, they found that, you know, round edges are stronger than sharp edges when it comes to, you know, bolt lugs. So this is much more akin to something that Knights has come out with, which was a squad automatic weapon that they found out that the bolts were shearing around, I think it was 5,000 rounds. So they rounded those bolts, the lugs, and making them a lot stronger. It's exactly what SIG did with this bolt. It sucks that it's a proprietary bolt. However, again, if you're buying spare barrels, they come with a bolt. So, you know, there's, there's that silver lining. Now, as you can see, it literally looks like a chopped down M4 bolt, M16, AR-15 bolt. However, it's not. If you look under here, they have a captive firing pin or tension pin, which I really wish more companies would do. It has a spring in the firing pin area to prevent it from going off if that bolt gets a little bit too hot going back into battery, which is a nice touch. They also added an out of battery firing pin block too. So that's a slick option. The other great thing is this bolt can get away with being disassembled without taking the quote unquote dog bone out. And it's a little bit of a pain in the ass to do it, but it can be done. I do believe on the Gen 1s, don't correct me on this because I'm not military arms channel. The dog leg on the original was a little bit harder to, to take in and out, if it could even be taken in and out. I'm not entirely positive, but overall they designed the uh, bolt carrier to be a little bit more you know, user friendly. Going back to the original purpose of at least <clears throat> the Rattler was to kind of combine the best of the LVAW on the civilian market. And I think that is really revolutionary of SIG. They've always been a company that does want to test the waters. They do want to push the envelope on things. Unfortunately, they usually end up landing on their back more than their feet on their initial runs. They're just, they've always been notorious of that. However, usually on gen, the Gen 2s or 3s, they are rock star designs. They work as as advertised. And I personally think that, you know, that is why SIG is winning all these contracts. They've won a contract for the Rattler, for the, the new PDW, for the military. They've won the, um, the machine gun contract. They've won the new rifle contract. And that 277 Fury and the, uh, the SIG, I think it's the Raptor, that is just a, a grown up full frame MCX as opposed to the MPX or the normal MCX. I think it's really cool, really forward thinking. Uh, but again, they usually end up using, letting the uh, civilians beta test this stuff first. But reliability, um, again, very first time I went out, I had a, a bit of trouble trying to get that thing to cycle. Uh, but again, it was new. Uh, I was shooting it in, you know, 30 degree weather. So I'm sure the oil and everything thickening up didn't help things, but 
progressively as I shot. I wasn't getting failures to eject or anything. It was ejecting, it was just not enough gas to fully lock the bolt back. And sometimes it wouldn't strip around. SIG also on their barrels uses the proprietary taper system that um, <coughs> Q designed. And so Kevin, when he went and made his own company, you know, SIG had already put the taper barrel system in just about everything that they own. And it is, it is a good idea. The Mark 12 had a taper system to it, you know, two decades ago. The taper systems work. They tend to not allow cans and muscle devices to back off. Now, another thing you gotta keep in mind is a lot of suppressor companies will not warranty a barrel this short, even for 300 blackout. Five and a half inches is really, really short. And uh, the barrel twist rate is one in five. It is a super tight twist rate. Uh, that is designed to stabilize 220 grain bullets in a very short barrel. Now, when you start getting into supers, I found, again, with the 8.6 blackout, with that one and three twist rate, that the tight twist rate works super well on subsonics. However, on supers, you want to get a monolithic type bullet, a all copper bullet because what happens is that twist rate is so tight that most modern jackets don't want to stabilize very well in that tight of a twist. It ends up you know, giving you end cap strikes. Keep that in mind. Um, this rifle will not, don't make the mistake that I did. It will not cycle round nose. So if you have a whole bunch of 220 grain round nose subs that you want to load up, don't do it. Um, my can is very not happy with me because I had a end cap strike because of those bullets. Um, I was fortunate enough to find that out a little too late, but the round nose won't cycle for obvious reasons. Uh, most round nose won't cycle in a modern firearm. It's not a bolt action. It's a, a single feed action. So, you know, keep that in mind when you go to shoot one of these things if you're a reloader try to keep with your your standard full metal jacket pointy bullets or uh, this this barrel luckily actually stabilizes those berries plated 220 grains at least my barrel does I was a bit worried about that after I purchased it when it said maximum of one and seven twist not, nothing tighter it seems to do just fine in my rattler I'm wondering if that's a twist rate plus barrel length issue but other guys that have a one in an eight or even a or, or a one in five and even a one in seven twist rate do have issues with it. So obviously test your loads. Um, be responsible. Don't shoot it with your damn can on while you're testing. It's just common sense. <clears throat> Otherwise, I've really loved the the accuracy, the reliability of it once it was worn in. It's a uh, it's been a great rifle, and I can't wait to hit the range more with this. Now, shooting this rifle in particular, it's kind of cool because you can shoot 5.56 five, and 300 blackout, and it's literally just a barrel change. It takes, you know, two minutes, and you don't have to have a spare upper. Everything is a system, and I like, especially with the tax stamps, I like having just spare parts instead of a whole upper to go with. Now, keep in mind, the one thing I do want to touch base with you guys on the MCX Rattler, the MCX Cane Brake, they are not compatible with standard Virtus barrels and uh, uppers. So on the upper, the portion that mates with the handguard, it is, I think, about an inch to an inch and a quarter shorter than the standard Virtus handguard. So your Virtus handguards won't fit this, it won't marry to the top here, and vice versa. The cane brake and rattler handguards are too short. Uh, they will not mate, they will, they will stop short. The other issue is your uh, portion of the bolt carrier that your piston impinges on right here. Again, it's shorter to make up for that length. That is why you have Virtus only and, and rattler only barrels because when this thing 
is made it up. So you can see like that, that piston has to hit that guide rod to unlock. Well, with the Virtus, the Virtus is longer. So it'll hit that piston and it'll never come home because it's, it's too long. Uh, a lot of people are not harping on that. Uh, some people are using their reviews and calling it a Rattler. When in reality, it's a 6.25 inch through in a blackout Virtus, not a five and a half inch Rattler. When these first came in, I wasn't really interested in it. Uh, I just didn't like the look of the handguard. Um, it was too blocky for me, but when the cane break came out, it checked every mark off of my, I really want an MP5, but I can't afford an H and K. I can't afford a true H and K, which is a two ta tax stamp gun. And on top of that, the fact that it's ex inexplicably hard to find an SD, uh, Dakota Gunworks, I think it is, makes one. Again, I don't want to spend you know four or five grand on something that's just a blaster for me. So, you know, having this SD style handguard and being able to shoot through in a blackout suppressed, super quiet. I mean, I've taken uh, pest control to a whole new level when I'm shooting inside my house at some of these pests that are in the backyard. And I'm not bugging the neighbors. That's really the whole intent on this rifle is to be as quiet as possible. And of course, you know, I'm doing everything legally, but you, you have to be good stewards. As uh, the Second Amendment constantly gets attacked, we have to be good stewards of our rights. Getting into people's faces, screaming at them, threatening them is not the way to go forward. If you look at things like, you know, abortion rights, um, the people that are screaming the loudest are getting a very, very negative pushback because even though it might be considered their right, they're so violently angry about their rights that it really leaves a bad taste in people's mouths. You know, I'm a libertarian. Uh, I think a lot of you have figured that out. I really don't care what you do, all right? Um, as long as you're not affecting me, I don't care, but, not but against rights, you need to present yourself as a reasonable person. And, and the reality is people are not reasonable anymore. So please be kind, train hard. Always something audio wise here. So please, get training uh, as the mall shooter in, what was it, Can not Kansas, the, the, the mall shooter that was uh, shot by Mr. Dickens, that kid was 22 years old, he'd only been concealed carrying for a year, he had practiced, he had put in the work, he engaged a threat at 40 yards with 10 shots, 8 shots hitting the bad guy, and he proceeded to en engage and close with the enemy. So if a 22-year-old can do it, you should too. You should always be carrying. You should always be training. And until next time, guys, please like and subscribe. Uh, be kind. Get training. And also, get fit. All right? The number one most dangerous thing in America is not a beer. It's not a uh, political party. It's your health. And being drastically overweight, you know, most of my young adult life really showed me uh, how badly that affects your quality of life. And to be an effective citizen and the ability to defend yourself and to defend others requires you to be in shape. So please get out there Find an exercise that you like to do. Keep doing it, uh, whether it's walking, CrossFit, powerlifting, strongman, bodybuilding, whatever it is. Get out there, get fit, and enjoy your life, guys.